thank you for coming tonight. I a script which I'm going to go to because this is a really challenging subject and I just want to make sure I, I touch on all the points. So, um, you know, I was, um, I'm new to my position at the center. I was a board member at the center since 2014, uh, during the time that we actually built the Crisis Walking Center down on North Cascade. And it was a real privilege to be a board member, but I was given an opportunity to come to work as a full-time employee and, and get my badge and everything. So I've been really thrilled to be able to do that uh, for the center. Um, but more importantly, I became um, familiar with the center's work due to a family member who, as an adolescent, was having thoughts of suicide. And I reached out to the center. Uh, we were able to get him services. And it really convinced me at that moment the importance of organizations like the center, community mental health organizations like the center. Um, and so, you know, we are a safety net. And we help people at their, uh, oftentimes, their most vulnerable and, and most needed times. So um, I also come um, to this conversation, you know, both of my role as an educator. I teach mental health first aid and safe talk and QPR. Um, but I also come, again, obviously with my, my uh, family member's experience, but my own experience growing up as an adolescent with pretty regular thoughts of suicide growing up in the 70s. And back then, boy, you know, we wouldn't have an event like this. So, you know, I think on one hand, we've made tremendous progress. And um, so I come at this conversation for, for those reasons. And I think, you know, many of you probably are here for similar reasons. I think one thing we can safely say is that all of us, have been touched by suicide at one point in our life. Um, so again, I, I pr very much appreciate your being here tonight. Um, you, I'm also appreciative because you're willing to shine a light on, on what is a, a topic that typically stays in the darkness. Um, and I think shining a light on this topic is so important. Um, it's, it's a hard conversation. Tonight we will have some hard conversations around this topic. Um, and and there's, no, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Um, it's a challenging and difficult topic. Um, and I know for some of you, it will probably, uh, could possibly, as it does for myself, trigger some emotions. So we have a number of staff members from the center here. If y'all could just show a hands, those that want to, that just who are the staff members. So, you know, if you do need help, um, find one of us and we'll be here to help you. So. Um, please do that. Um, I think the last thing I want to touch on is that you'll hear my colleagues tonight, our experts here, talk about um, that suicide is a preventable death. Um, we believe that at the center. Um, I believe that. But that doesn't mean that we will prevent every suicide. And that's a really, really rotten thing to have to acknowledge. Um, but it's true. Um, and sometimes that will trigger in us some really challenging emotions. You know, anger, sadness, hate, fear. Um, as you'll hear my colleague talk, those are perfectly normal reactions to it. But again, tonight in this space, I recognize that some of us may experience some of those emotions. So again, I want to just reemphasize, if you need some help, find one of us uh, from the center and we'll get you connected up with someone to help. Um, you know, our goal, as I said, suicide is preventable. We won't stop every suicide, but we will work harder as a result to prevent the next one. And I think that's why many of us are here tonight. So, again, thank you. Um, before we get started and I introduce our, our panel, um, I'm going to let our CEO, Shelley Spalding, say a few words um, about um, tonight's topic. And so I'm going to invite Shelley to come on up. Thanks, Paul. Paul, you kind of said all of the things that like fall heavy on my heart and uh, the really hard things. I think everybody in this room, as Paul said, has been touched by suicide, whether that's uh, a friend or a loved one that you know has died by suicide, or if um, you or somebody you know has um, survived a suicide attempt, or whether you're just a concerned community member. Um, we're, we're glad you're here, um, as Paul uh, talked about. I will say I think these guys are experts. Of course, I get to work with them every day and feel very, very proud to, uh, to get to work with them. So they will have a lot to tell us. Um, 
In the U.S. alone, in 2020, almost 45,000 individuals died by suicide. You guys probably know this, Colorado ranks sixth in the nation for the number of suicides. And the part that's extra heartbreaking to me is that research shows only 26% of people that die by suicide reached out and had any kind of behavioral health treatment in the year prior to their death. So that tells me we have a long way to go to reach people um, who are struggling. So as Paul said, we're here tonight to talk about some of the resources that are available and frankly just to learn more um, about suicide. But before we get started, I think it's really important to recognize everybody who has been touched by suicide. So I want to start us off with just a moment of silence, a moment of remembrance for all those individuals that we've, that we've lost uh, through suicide. Thank you guys for being here. Um, as Paul said, thank you for um, potentially being vulnerable. And if anyone needs assistance tonight, please, please know we're here for you. Paul? Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. Uh, so we do have a panel, and, and these are truly the experts in the room. They work with their clients every day um, to address suicidality, to help people in their path toward life. Um, and so I want to introduce, and this part I'm really going to read because they took the time to give me their, their bio, so I want to make sure I get it straight. Um, Dr. Nicholas Taylor is a licensed psychologist and a certified addiction specialist. Um, he has been active in the community and practiced in the, in the area for over 20 years and has been with the Center for Mental Health for a total of 10 years. He specializes in community-based treatment models and has been an advocate for community involvement in suicide prevention and treatment. Uh, Laura Byard is a licensed professional counselor and one of our clinical directors and has lived in our community and worked at the center for five years and has worked in mental health for over 20 years. Um, I didn't realize this about Laura, but she was born in, on a farm and raised in an agricultural community, which I think informs her passion for improving uh, mental health services in rural communities such as ours. And then finally, Ed Hagens. Um, Ed is kind of a legend in this community. I've learned after, after knowing Ed for the last, I guess, almost seven, eight years. Um, he's our director of physical operations and special projects. And he's lived and worked, um, worked at the clinic and lived in Montrose for the last uh, 12 years. And um, he's been a licensed professional counselor for 27 years. So thank you to the three of you for being here tonight. Um, we'll get started. A quick, couple quick housekeeping. Uh, things. Uh, bathrooms are out the door and to the left. Um, and we will take questions after tonight's presentations. Laura will introduce the question and answer. Um, you all have cards in your, in your packets, I hope. Um, but feel free if you want to just uh, write a question on there. If you don't want to ask it, um, go ahead and write it and I'll come by and collect them. Um, and then uh, we're gonna turn, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Higgins. You're first up. So thank you, Ed. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Good evening, guys. Um, where I want to start is uh, really talking about what experience I bring to the table uh, for this conversation. Um, and, and, and Paul was kind enough to indicate my, my professional history. Um, but I'm not going to reference that much tonight. Um, yeah, there's letters behind my name, blah, 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 that doesn't matter. What matters tonight in this conversation and every conversation that I have about suicide is the lived experience that I bring to this equation. Um, I'm going to be really, really frank with you tonight. I promise you that I won't be dishonest or deceive you in any way about this topic, nor will my colleagues. Some of what we talk about tonight may bring up emotion for you. Maybe it may hurt. I don't know. But I want you to know now that's not our intent. And, and I apologize to you in advance if anything we say, as honest as it is, brings that up for you. But there's something alive and well in what Shelley shared earlier. 
and that's stigma. If only 26 or so percent, is that what you said, Shelley? Um, actually reached out for professional or any type of behavioral health care in the year prior. That tells us stigma is alive and well. I'm going to show you some data here in a moment that shares that as well. My lived experience that I bring to the table today, um, I'm a two-time attempt survivor when I was a teenager. Um, I'm here today because somebody cared enough about me to have the opportunity for me to have hope. A few years ago, the ugly beast of suicide raised its head again in my life. Shelley Spaulding, good friend of mine, Michael Flora, they were the ones that noticed it, even though I wasn't talking about it. The support of my wife, who's sitting in the back tonight, in fact, um, those are the people, those connections, that allow me to be here today with you. I'm in recovery right now. I don't know what happens beyond this, except I choose to take a step towards life every day when I get up. Some days are easier than others. Some days are really, really hard. But I'm committed to my recovery. And so part of my recovery is making sure that I share in an unabashed fashion not only what I know professionally as a counselor, but what I know from my experience with regard to suicide. And so, I mean, Laura's going to facilitate some Q&A at the end. I hope you take that opportunity to pick all of our brains around this topic. Like I said, I promise that, you know, I may, if I don't have the answer, I'm going to tell you we don't have the answer for that. And I think you'll see that here in a moment. Hopefully this uh, technology works for me. So Shelly shared uh, 2020 data with you. Uh, 2020 is still kind of incomplete, so we're going to go back a year to 2019. And the other reason we want to go to 2019 is because uh, there's something else that happened in 2020 that kind of has messed with the data a bit. You can probably guess what that is. That's COVID. Uh, yeah, I mean, young person in the room immediately looking at me like I'm, uh, <laughs> duh, Obvious, obviously it's COVID. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that. This is a tough topic to find humor in, as you might imagine. Um, and uh, thank you for helping us smile a little bit. So we're going to go all the way back to 2019. And we're going to set the stage for why does suicide matter. So in 2019, 47,511 Americans died by their own hand. Of that number, 1,312 Coloradans died by their own hand. There's two numbers in the literature uh, for Coloradans, one slightly le less than that. Um, we're going with the higher, more reliable source on that number. What that equates to nationally, 14 and a half persons per 100,000 died by suicide in 2019. In Colorado, that is 22 people by 100,000. Wyoming, uh, the worst that year, they've been in a battle with uh, New Mexico uh, at 29, and then New Jersey on the East Coast, where we see most of our single-digit states are on the East Coast. Um, there's some theories behind that. At eight per 100,000. And the reason we look at it per 100,000 is so we can look at it as apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. And that will probably make a little more sense when we get down into county-level data. But uh, because we have such diverse populations around the country, from one state to the other, we want to try to um, adjust that um, by looking at it per 100,000. So let's take it into the region. You can see here in Delta County, we had 31 suicides per 100,000 in 2019. Uh, Gunnison County, 32. Hinsdale, zero. That does not mean they had zero suicides, although in this particular year they happen to, I believe, have zero suicides. Typically when you see a zero rate, that means there were not enough suicides to actually make it to one per 100,000. Uh, and so that's where Hinsdale County was at for 2019. Montrose County, uh, 19 per 100,000. Uray County, 40. 
Uh, Urey County had a high year that year. Uh, previous year, if I remember correctly, was much lower than that. Um, all these counties saw some type of drop during, during 2020. Um, but Urey County, that was kind of an anomaly year for them. San Miguel County, 16. And then region-wide, we're looking at about 23 um, suicides uh, per 100,000. Right in there, pretty close to the state rate. So obviously, if we had 47,000 Americans die by suicide, that's 47,000 Americans that were impacted directly by taking their own life. We now have data that supports and shows us how many people were actually impacted by that pond, that pebble hitting the pond and the ripple effect. So if tw to give you an example of, uh, of how much this is happening, we see about 25 attempts per single suicide. So all those attempts kind of make these numbers uh, even bigger than what I'm showing you here, um, if they had been completions. So for each suicide, about 135 people are going to be exposed to that on average. That's what the research shows us. Of that 135, 53 are going to have a short-term disruption, 25 a major life disruption, 11 people, typically those closest to the deceased, are going to have fairly devastating effects because of the suicide. The point here, the actions of one has an immediate and long-lasting impact on the many, no matter how you slice it. There are people, uh, leaders in fact, in our region that will look at these numbers and say, you know, there's far worse ways and more frequent ways people are dying that we, may, we need to pay attention to than suicide. I don't believe that for a second. I believe this data shows and supports that we ought to be paying attention to this. You can see there, in the United States, if these numbers are even remotely accurate, about 6.4 million people impacted by suicide in 2019. 177,000 Coloradans. So we'll segue, if we've made the argument for why it matters, the inevitable question is, why do they do it? Why would I have done it? Why would any of us ever compel be compelled to take our own life. Um, the easy answer, there's around half a dozen uh, major categories that uh, suicide can fall into as far as why somebody might complete suicide. One of those is impulsivity. We see that a lot with teenagers, but it's not just teenagers. Uh, in, meaning uh, taking uh, one's life, they may not have intended to, it might have been an accident, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, mental health issues. That could be depression, anxiety, could be uh, some type of psychosis that is contributing to this. We know that somewhere between 92 and 94 percent of um, individuals that attempt suicide have some underlying uh, mental health condition. That didn't mean it's diagnosed, but when you do a psychological autopsy, you can you see in the record that they may have had some type of mental health condition. In addition, uh, also um, consequence can be a reason someone dies by suicide. By consequence, um, someone going bankrupt, someone in prison facing a, a long-term sentence. Um, there's a lot of, of what we call the e, uh, uh, these easy answers. Um, in other words, substance use falls in there. The hard answer? If I died when I was 17 years old, um, the two times I attempted, I didn't write a note. My parents wouldn't have known why. They wouldn't have had a clue. If I had written a note, they would have still asked why. Somebody dies by suicide, we don't always know. In fact, most oftentimes, don't really know why they made the choice that they made. We do know that they had convinced themselves to believe that this permanent, long-term solution was to address what we might have looked at as outsiders as what's oftentimes a temporary problem. But we don't end up knowing why, necessarily. Saw a, um, a side note, I saw a I got to see the snap recently of someone uh, who completed suicide. And uh, it reminded me once again, 
as detailed as this young man was, um, just totally compelled to ask why. Why would you do that? When we ask why, we oftentimes are uh, seeking causation. What caused this? Why did this person do it? Human beings, we're hardwired to be alive. We're hardwired to need to know what the cause is. The problem in this uh, with suicide is we don't get that luxury. There's way too many reasons why someone might die by suicide. 47,000 people in 2019, my theory, 47,000 different reasons someone died by suicide that year. I think Shelley said in 2020, 45,000, so we saw a slight dip uh, because of COVID. Um, I, I don't know if we're, if we're going to see a higher year this year or not, or is it going to continue to trend down? It feels like we're coming back into um, the height of what we had in 2019, but that just may be my own emotional response to it. So instead of looking at causal factors, what we want to look at are risk factors and warning signs. And what that helps us do in looking at risk factors and warning signs is be able to identify someone that might be at risk of dying by suicide. And, and you can see here the definition for risk factors. They're the characteristics of a person or their environment that increase that likelihood to die by suicide. Uh, and we've got a pretty long list here. Nick's going to go into a, a more detail in terms of what you will do or what you can do. Um, uh, if you experience any of these things uh, with a friend or loved one. One of the big ones, prior suicide attempts. I already told you, I've attempted twice um, and uh, had some pretty heavy consideration a few years ago. That puts me at a greater risk for suicide than the person sitting next to me on the airplane, um, nine times out of ten. Misuse and abuse of alcohol or drugs, mental illness, access to lethal means, a lot of gun ownership in our region. A lot of gun owners don't die by suicide. Le access to lethal means uh, simply makes it easier for someone to uh, make that decision. In fact, the reason these aren't causal, and, and we can apply this to pretty much all of them, there's a lot of people with mental illness not, that don't attempt suicide ever in the course of their, um, their diagnosis. Access to lethal means, what the comment about gun owners. Um, social isolation, particularly here on the Western Slope, we have folks that are, um, uh, that uh, Western American mentality, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that rugged individualism uh, can be a contributing factor, not a causal factor. Chronic disease, limited remote access to care, um, so on and so forth. A um, couple to make mention of, and we can talk a little bit more about these uh, in the Q&A if you want to, uh, link between altitude and suicide. Uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of research on that showing that it's a slight increase, um, but just like guns, there's a lot of people living at one mile or more above sea level. A lot of people. And the vast majority of people living at one mile or above sea level are not at risk of suicide. Um, then you can see here history of trauma or bullying, and then members of uh, our higher risk groups, such as veterans, LGBTQ+. Um, in our region, farmers and ranchers, uh, and age as well, uh, whether it's adolescents or the, uh, one of the most risky groups are uh, middle-aged white men and older. A couple of last things here, and, and this will support what Nick's going to talk to you about here in a moment. The more risk factors you observe, the more serious you ought to be taking what the person is experiencing across the table from you. The more of those on that list that you can check for that person, the more serious you ought to be taking it and take action. Like I said earlier, suicide is a permanent solution to an often temporary problem. And like Shelley said, uh, and Paul, I believe, uh, suicide is one of the most preventable, if not the most preventable form of death um, in all of our lists of how you can die in, here in the United States and across the planet. Um, 
We believe that for the same reason our airline industry believes airplane crashes are preventable. We have to believe in that. We wouldn't want an airplane industry that believes airplane crashes, mm, we can take how many a year? Zero. It needs to be a zero issue. And we need to have that same philosophy about suicide. We may not prevent all of them, but we must look at them as all of them being preventable. Um, I'll be around for the Q&A and stay after if you want to have some one-on-one uh, um, -on -one conversation as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Taylor. Thank you, Ed. But I would also add what a perfect act to follow. Because those of us in this room, if we think about it, and we look at those statistics, we're talking about a lot more people who are involved in trying to help someone who... And I know each of us in this room are probably thinking of some folks. Thinking, what could we have done or what can we do? And I think that any presentation or any discussion around suicidality would be incomplete if we didn't try to answer this question, how to talk with someone about suicide. So let's start just by throwing out some, some, uh, some myths, some common myths. Don't ever bring up suicide because you don't want to plant any ideas, right? Didn't we often think about that with our kids? We don't ever want to talk about it with our kids because we don't want to get them thinking about something. And that is a complete myth. Because the fact of the matter is, if they're kind of already going there, us not talking about it is a lot worse. So let's look at it, and if you can, just kind of visit what it would be like to be in this kind of a situation. So here you are. Here's those risk factors. Ed mentioned many of these. So you have a loved one. They're feeling like a burden. They're being isolated. They're manifesting increased anxiety, feeling trapped or in unbearable pain, and you're noticing it. There's increased substance use, and they're looking for ways to access lethal means. There's increased anger, rage, extreme mood swings. I like the guy smashing his phone, you know. Ex expressing hopelessness, sleeping too little or too much, or finally talking or posting about wanting to die or making plans for suicide. So you see something like that in somebody else, and now you're this person, right? And you're seeing this, and you inevitably ask this question. Okay, so now what? So my hope is, in the few minutes that I have with you, that I can, I can help answer that question. So I'll provide some information tonight, but don't feel like if you didn't catch it, you, you know, uh-oh, we got to go back and, and, and somehow recreate this information in your memory. Uh, Laura's actually going to be talking about a wonderful class, the QPR course, Question, Persuade, Refer. And that goes even into more detail and gives better training about what to do when you're in the presence of someone who may be manifesting these kinds of warning signs. But let's look at some practical steps. So what to do? First of all, we act on observations. So if we notice something, it's always better for us to do something about it. So let me ask you this, but what if we're wrong? <laughs> Hallelujah, right? <laughs> So we were wrong, and we brought it up, and they say, no, no, I'm going through a tough time, but trust me, there's nothing going on about hurting myself. I'm not thinking about that at all. It's just all related to this, and I'm getting the right kind of help for it. And then we're relieved, we're excited, and we can help. So it is a win-win situation to act on observations. Because if we're right, then it gives us the opportunity to do something about it. So if we notice those warning signs, Let's act on those observations. What does that mean, act on observations? First and foremost, we're going to do little exercises here. Let's manage our own thoughts and fears. And, I mean, I guess I'll go ahead and, and put myself out here on the, on the vulnerability block since Ed did such a good job. By a show of hands, how many have had a child who've come to them and said, I'm having thoughts of taking my life? I don't know what that was like for you, but I'm a psychologist. I do this stuff every single day. You'd think I'd have this figured out, right? And you know what I found myself saying? Those were my exact words, by the way. What do you say? So let's begin by managing our own thoughts and fears. I heard Laura say something once that really struck me, and she may be hinting at it tonight. 
You know, if our kids showed up and they had a broken arm, we'd go into like task mode. We're like, okay, we know what to do with that. You know, the arm, it's not in the shape it's supposed to be. We better get that checked out. We know the numbers to call. We know the steps to follow. But for some reason, when a kid comes to us and talks about hurting themselves, it's so terrifying that we often find ourselves in a place where we don't know what to do. And the reason that is is because we actually slip into a different part of our brains. If you look at the human brain, I think the best model is the fist model of the brain. If you look at the human brain, it's hopefully a little bit bigger than this. But nonetheless, <laughs> there is the outer portion of the brain, which is the cerebral cortex, especially that front part of the brain, the prefrontal lobes. That's where our personality and our, our intuition, our, our intentional thinking, all of that happens. Deep underneath that are what are called the midbrain regions of the brain. So this is where the amygdala and the limbic regions are found. This is where some of the more primitive parts of our behaviors, our actions are found. So this is where hunger and sleep and things are found. So what happens when we get surprised by something like that, we actually slip back into this part of our brain because this is that reactive part of our brain that keeps us alive in scary situations. It's that fight or flight response. You know, maybe you've had that happen when you're in a situation and you find yourself reacting rather than thinking, which in some situations is a really good idea. I mean, if you're with Ed and you guys are out four-wheeling and you decide to stop and take a break, right? And you're just sitting there and all of a sudden you hear a brrrr. And there's a very large black bear approaching quickly. That's not the time to think, well, that's an interesting color for that black bear. Why do they call them black bears when they're actually brown? And those teeth, well, they look pointy. You, know, you don't want to be up here in that moment. You want to be back here in that midbrain region where you're like, ah, get in the Jeep and drive fast, right? <laughs> you want to be in that reactive state. And that's, that's part of our biology. It helps us out that we react that way. We react that way when we're in the face of something threatening, or terrifying, fearful. Well, a child or a loved one coming to you and telling you, that they're thinking about taking their life is frightening, it's terrifying, it's fearful. And so naturally, we're going to find ourselves in that part of our brain that make us say things like, we don't know what to say because we're not really thinking. We're in that reactive state. Now, I love some of the training that our police officers receive. Officer Cox could talk about this, right? You know, what happens if you get into tunnel vision in a stressful situation? Whew, it's going to get bad quick. you got to be thinking. So they're trained, right, to not kick into that fight or flight response. Have you ever noticed the police officers in a stressful situation, how calm they can sound? Like, man, how are they doing that? It's training. So let's do a little bit of that training right now. So the best way to bring yourself from that limbic region, that reactive region of your brain, into your thinking region is to breathe is to breathe. And it's not just about breathing, because the inhale of your breath, as important as that is, that's also what's called the sympathetic inhale, meaning it's still kind of an anxious part of your reaction. Have you ever noticed that? Like, <laughs> your inhale can sound pretty anxious, but your exhale is what relaxes you. So can we all do that? Just have a little bit of fun here. It's a deep inhale. If you can get seven to ten counts and that exhale, good for you. So if a loved one comes to you and says something about this, breathe in deep and then get an extended exhale. It also gives you a little bit of time to think. Now, have you noticed that therapists are really good at listening? That's because we're also breathing because we're trying to make sure that we're going to give the right response. So we're breathing. And on our, inhale, on our inhale, we're thinking, I have no idea what to say right now. <laughs> right? Come on, another yeah. therapist, right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> and on our exhale, we're like, OK, it'll be all right. We can work through this. So give it that nice, deep exhale, maybe some positive comments. We can work through this. Get yourself back into that thinking portion of your brain. You'll actually feel yourself move into that portion of your brain. I would say 
this is the most important step of talking to somebody about suicide. There's actually research, amazing sociological research, social psychological research, that looks at what happens when we're in the presence of somebody who's into heightened, anxious, and very aroused state. They did this research, and it was always on, you know, they don't, college freshmen are always the, the laboratory rats. So, so back in the day before, you know, there was such a thing as, you know, scientific ethics, um, it, there, was, there was a research project done. And there were college freshmen recruited, and um, they, they sat at tables. And then uh, at each of these tables, they would have somebody present. And the people who were present received a saline injection. And the saline injection, they didn't know what it was. For some of them, it was just saline. For others, that saline had epinephrine in it, which causes a state of anxiety. And then they would just have casual discussions. Well, obviously, the people that received the epinephrine were in a more heightened state. They were kind of in that, that region of the brain, and their breathing was different. But what was interesting was what was observed by the, about the other people who were sitting at the table as well. Those who were sitting at the table with those who were anxious, <laughs> their breathing changed, and they started picking up some of that anxiety. So this anxiety is contagious. So we are trained that when we're in the presence of somebody who's making these kinds of statements, we've got to keep ourselves calm. Otherwise, what do you think will happen? You'll get anxious. And we're going to elevate them. Whereas just the opposite is true, is if we're calm, then they're going to calm down as well. I had a great supervisor, and he was, he was also a practitioner of martial arts. He was just fantastic. But in those very, very tense situations, maybe where someone's talking about killing themselves, he would make sure that he had a cup of coffee in his hand, and he would make sure that it was filled up all the way to the brim. And then he would force himself to hold that cup of coffee without any of it spilling over, and with there being no ripples in the surface of that coffee as he was listening. And the effect that that had on the people in the room was notable. They would pay attention. They would notice, look how calm he is. And they would settle down. So manage your own thoughts and fears. Okay, thoughts about that? Any comments? Please. Yeah, I'm just curious if you, um, would that, I mean, I don't know because I've never had thoughts like that, but I just wonder if somebody's in a vulnerable state and they're, anxious and thinking, well, yeah, I, I, I want to I wanna end my own life, and, and you're just, okay, we can get through this. Right. Are, the, are right, you right. bored? You right, know? right, right. Good, good, good. Good question. Good question. I mean, I'm telling you I'm going to end my life. Good question. So, calm, you know? so we're calm, but we're present. We're very, very present. We're with them right there where they are. We're not missing a beat with them, are we? So we're staying present. If we were anxious, we'd actually be disconnecting with them because now we're more involved in our own stuff, right? Huh, what are we going to, we better, how do we, you know, suddenly like, well, pff, I guess I'm no longer the topic because you're so dealing with your own stuff. Okay. So we stay calm, but we stay present. And because we have that capacity, then we can invite there to be some space that we can work. But without that space, we can't do anything, can we? All we're doing is filling it with chaos. We need some space in which we can work. Great question. Great question. So we don't want to seem disinterested, do we? We want to seem calm, capable, and present. I'm just thinking about, you know, when, when law enforcement shows up in a stressful situation, oh, they're present. <laughs> they, they know exactly what's going on, and they're thinking, and they're noticing, and they're paying attention, and making the right plans on how to deal with the situation. That's what we want. Okay, great question. Thank you. We can circle back for, on more of that. Yeah, you bet. Uh, do the Q&A if you'd like to. Excellent. Um, then, once we've noticed some things, we've got to prepare for this conversation. So better than just, you know, hey, the person just came from a stressful day at school or whatever. Let's just catch them, you know, off guard. Let's prepare for it. Let, let's think it through. What is it we're going to say? When is it going to be a good time for us to start this conversation? So once we figure out a good time to start it, now how do we bring it up? You know, I think Ed was perfect in the things that he shared. Let's, let, let's not beat around the bush. Sometimes we got to talk about what's going on. And we may have to say, I'm really concerned. I've noticed some things. And I think we probably need to talk about it. It seems like now is a good time. So let me tell you what I'm concerned about. And I'm hoping we can be pretty open with one another. So I saw on Facebook that you said, 
maybe life's just not worth living. I'm having some scary thoughts. We're, we're going we're to cut right to it. doesn't matter what it is. We're, we're going to talk right about it. I'm not sure what Shelley said to you, Ed, or what Michael Flores said, but they noticed some things, and they took you aside, and in a very direct way, expressed their concerns. And think of the difference that that made, that they would do that, as opposed to Shelley thinking, Ed, man, I meant if there's anyone who's got it all together, it's this guy. I'm just making this up in my head, right? Oh, it can be anybody. Start the conversation, then listen without judgment. We become all ears. We become all ears. And people don't believe you're listening to them unless your eyes are right on them. So pay attention to that gaze. So if, if, we're, if we're anxious and our eyes are every place else, they're not going to feel like we're really listening. We look right at them and we listen. We listen without judgment. This is not the time to be saying, well, you shouldn't be thinking that because think, think, think of all the positive things that we have to live for. Right? Now is not the time to be jumping to solutions, right? Now we're just listening. And get the person talking. So we listen. And we might ask more questions. Really? Can, can you tell me more about that? Is that right? Oh, I guess I didn't really notice. Say more, please. So we're queuing, asking for their more information to really get them talking. Now we're going to ask directly about suicide. Now in our profession, we are very guilty of beating around the bush. Are you maybe having thoughts that someday you might you know, not want to be you know, where you are right now, but maybe someplace else, if that's an option, perhaps? Excuse me. Yes. Can you go back to the previous slide? You bet. I want to take a picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about I even get out of the way? Even better. <laughs> sure. And I can make this available to everyone. Everyone wants it. So how do we ask directly about suicide? We ask it this way. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Practice those words for just a moment. Are you thinking about killing yourself? What's the difference between that phrase and saying, so you're sometimes having thoughts about maybe not wanting to be around, maybe, perhaps? What's the difference? It's direct. It's direct. And if you're somebody who's having those thoughts, what do you think that does to you? Being asked that question, what do you think it does? Does it maybe jar you so that you, you're so shocked that somebody asked you that? I don't know, but maybe you just think, well, yeah, yeah. I was thinking that. Right. I, I don't know. Right. Uh, do you mind? Yeah. So what would the experience be being asked directly that kind of question? It's a reset. You're hitting, you're hitting the nail on, on the head. It's a reset even research around it in terms of how deliberately asking the question um, uh, does something in that primitive portion of our brain because as as we're going through this if you think about it as a process um, it's really convincing oneself that this is okay to do we've got to uh, if you think about our brain like a computer we've got to rewire that hardwiring to survive, to live, and convince ourselves that um, a permanent solution to a temporary problem is in fact okay. And when someone asks us, are you thinking about killing yourself? That forces the brain to be like, whoa, mm -hmm. and get those wires back in order really quickly. Yeah. And you gotta follow up after that with instilling hope, treatment, so on and so forth. Uh, but, th but what Nick's talking about is an opportunity builder. And then how do we build on that opportunity exactly. moving forward? Yeah. This is not the time to beat around the bush. This is the time to really, and it shows that you're not afraid to talk about a very difficult topic. You're not afraid to hear the truth. Because that's what we want, right? Maybe. Some of 
us might be afraid of the truth. Which is managing our own fears. And what about if the person says yes? Yeah. Then what are you going to do? This is what we're going to do. Next thing, we're going to ask about plans. Okay. Okay, I hear you. Are you making specific plans about how to do this? We, we need to talk about that. I, I appreciate that you've shared that with me. I want you to know that I hear you. That you are thinking about killing yourself. Now, are you making plans? Because I'm here with you, and we need to know that. Then we have to work on keeping that person safe, because if they start saying, yes, I, I have plans, we got to start figuring out what are we going to do to keep this person safe, and a lot of that has to do with managing legal means. So if the person says something about specific plans, and that includes something that is there in your home or at their disposal, We've got to get whatever that is, we've got to get some separation between them and that object. Or them and that means. But what about if it's your friend? If it's your friend. It's not at your house. Okay, maybe not at your house. So your friend says, yes, I am having thoughts about killing myself. We say, okay, what are your plans? I don't know. I saw a video, it was very, very powerful in the, in the training on treating suicidality. The guy said, I don't know, last night I was doing push-ups. And I set up a kitchen knife, propped it up on some books, right over my chest. And I just kept doing, doing push-ups until maybe I was just hoping I'd, you know, fatigue. So, whoo, that's going to, but okay, that, that was the plan. So, we got to do something about those knives, don't we? Especially that one knife that was used just last night. So, we might even ask to the friend, I'm glad you told me. So, let's talk about where that knife is right now and probably any other knives. Because right now, let's maybe focus on keeping you alive. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. The second? Encourage help seeking. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Because we're going to need some help. This is big, right? But the persons shared this with you. That means that they're open to getting some help. Otherwise, they wouldn't have told you, right? They've opened up enough to you. Okay, now let's, let's get some help. Let's get some help. And we're going to do it together. You know, we have at the Center for Mental Health a resource that we've never had before. Thanks to Shelly Spaulding and, and the board. Paul, you guys were great too. <laughs> but having a crisis stabilization unit in Montrose is unheard of in terms of the benefit that we have. We can call 252-6220 and get help immediately. We have mobile crisis help that can come and show up if that's needed. So if we're in a situation where we got to get some help right now, we can get that. We're going to call that number to figure out that whether or not maybe we need to have law enforcement come out, or maybe we need to go to the hospital, or we need to go to the CSU. We might need to do something right now, but we're going to figure out what needs to happen. And then finally, you got to look after yourself. Because once that episode's finished, and the person, thankfully, is at the crisis stabilization unit, and they're safe, and you did it, what happens to you? <laughs> you ever seen the, the Beetle Bailey comic strip, you know, when he's just a puddle on the ground? You kind of feel that way afterwards. Take care of yourself. You probably need to check in with somebody at that point. A loved one, a therapist, a counselor, a faith leader, whoever. Take care of yourself, because that's a big, heavy load that you just carried. But, and the whole purpose of tonight, did you notice I love the title? You saved a life. When I have the opportunity to do suicide assessment and treatment, we talk about saving a life. That's, that's, that's why we're there. This is a life-saving intervention. And it's worth it. So, finally, in closing, two of those numbers up there for this last year were people very close to me. And, uh, you know, again, I, I do this for a living. So I ask a lot of questions about what could have or how could have or what should I have done. And I think having these conversations so this kind of stuff is ready for us and it's accessible is where we need to be. Thank you again for being here tonight. Laura is now going to talk wonderfully about some of the resources and what we can turn to when we're getting, doing some of that help. 
So in our community, we have an amazing, caring network of community agencies, and I get to talk about them tonight, which is really nice. Um, so when you're ready to do something um, and build on what Ed and Nick have so wonderfully laid out, we have a ton of options in our community. And so one of the first ones is the one Commander Cox um, and I work together on. Um, he has been overseeing from a law enforcement side of things our co-responder program for several years now. And we work together. I don't know if you've heard nationally about co-responder programs, maybe, um, but it's a mental health clinician that is co-located and responding with law enforcement in a mental health crisis. So when our team of co-responders are on shift and you call 911, um, they'll respond with law enforcement to support and help that individual get connected with services. So it's an amazing program and a, and a wonderful partnership. So that's an option. So when you're in a situation um, and you call 911, just know that we're working together to make sure that the individual you're concerned about um, gets the care that they need. Another is our suicide risk assessment team um, through our community's collaborative management program. So what that is, is all of our partner agencies, and you can see them represented on the slide up there. Um, in that slide are individuals from not only the center, but the Montrose County School District, the Montrose Police Department, um, the Montrose County Sheriff's Office, Hilltop, the 7th Judicial District, um, Department of Human Services, all of our, our, our agencies in our community um, work together and collaboratively to um, support our families and youth when we're talking about suicide risk. And so there's a whole team of school counselors and administrators who are trained to sit down and meet with our students and appropriately assess them and then connect them with care. So if you're worried about a student, just know that that school is ready to take care of them. And then beyond the school is a whole team um, that is here to support our families. Um, the next one is our disaster behavioral health incident response. So one of the things that on the prevention continuum around suicide prevention is making sure that if there has been um, a loss in our community or um, an impact through a suicide attempt and we need to support a business or a community group, we have an incident response team that can respond and support. And that's an incredible program as, as served in a number of our community um, businesses and groups um, and helped them get through a very difficult time. And it allows supervisors and staff members and um, community members to get support and be able to deal with something that's really difficult. And in that work then we can help prevent maybe um, a continued stress or another response from that event. Um, we also provide treatment at the center. So CAMS treatment, um, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality, is an evidence-based treatment for suicidality. So when someone um, comes to our attention because they've been coping or dealing with suicidal thoughts, then we now have a treatment model that we utilize to help specifically address that as a treatment goal. So separate from um, other things that they might be dealing with, we have an evidence-based model for the treatment of suicidality. Any questions about those things? How do you treat it? Um, great question. Um, so in the CAMS model, um, we do a thorough assessment at session one um, that really gets at working collaboratively with the individual to fully understand um, the extent and the causes of their psychological pain. Um, so it's really like any, just like any other medical professional that you would go get care from. If you're going and you've got a significant concern medically going on with you, they're going to do a thorough assessment to understand, right? Like, what is the, what is the depth of this issue and, and how is it impacting your life and what are your concerns? And, and so we, who are the support systems? What are the risk factors? We do that thorough assessment, and then we work in a model where we reassess every session and work through that suicidality so that it becomes something that is, some, that is something the individual can manage. And a, and a big part of that is looking at drivers. Yep. So the CAMS model helps get very, very specific about what it is that seems to be driving these thoughts and behaviors. 
and then looking at what are some barriers that we can put in place to prevent those drivers from moving, moving to kind of higher levels of involvement. Um, it's, it's really cool. Um, and, and, and you, you know, the idea that you're, you're, you're sitting down with someone to save their life, it changes entirely the counseling experience. So know that if you connect someone, there's treatment. Um, and we can help people recover. Um, right now, if you don't have this number on your phone, um, get your phones out. Um, and, and let's get these numbers in your phone. So um, th there are options to call for help. We were talking earlier, and it's, you know, it's just, just like Nick and Ed were talking about. If someone came to you and they were said that they've been dealing with some pain in their arm and their neck, like you would start knowing what to do, right? And you would see if you needed to call someone. You would see if you needed to go to urgent care. You might call 911 or go to the ER. We can do that for suicidality as well. And these are some of the numbers that are there to support you. So 24 hours a day, um, 365 days a year, you can call the center support line. That 970-252-6220. So give that number out, share it. Um, if you don't know what to do, there are folks available who can help you. Colorado Crisis Services um, is another opportunity to reach out. 1-844-493-TALK. Um, if texting is easier, and sometimes it is in a crisis, you can text TALK to 38255. And then the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-272-8255. So if we have those numbers in the back, if you can get them um, written down and in your phone, but please, please do that. What else can you do? I was talking a second ago about the suicide risk assessment team through the school district um, and working with our partnership with them. Um, Safe to Tell, if you have I know, a kiddo connected with the school district, you've probably heard of Safe to Tell. Um, know that that's an option. That safe to tell alert will go to law enforcement and to designated um, individuals at the school district and they can follow up on any concerns um, and do a suicide risk assessment if it needs to be done. So safe to tell is another avenue um, and, and you don't have to know what to do or really know what your concern is, you can just reach out. There's an app for safe to tell um, that you can download on your phone, so easy access. Nick started talking about this earlier. Um, another opportunity to um, sign up is our QPR class, Question, Persuade, Refer. So if you're not sure how to have that conversation or you want to have some, some more training around what would that conversation be like, this is a class that you can sign up for. Our next QPR class is Thursday, October 7th. Um, from 12 to 1.30, you can sign up online at the center's website um, and get some more information. In addition to QPR, Mental Health First Aid is an amazing class um, to better understand what is mental health, what are mental health needs, and what are some things that I can do. Um, mental Health First Aid, if you're working, if you have a family member who's got a, a significant mental illness, or if you just want some more information for yourself, is an amazing class, and you can sign up for that as well. Probably many of us in this room got First Aid and CPR at some point in our lives. We would like mental health first aid to be in that same category as something that we, we just naturally get so that we can better take care of our friends and family and community members and have more understanding. Both of these classes are classes that you can sign up for and take. We offer them on a regular basis. So, what questions do you guys have um, after our presentation? And we'll be around if you uh, want to kind of wait and ask them. Laura, there's a question. If I were to call one of those numbers, who do I talk to? Who will answer the phone? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we have trained professionals that answer those phones and then connect you. Um, and we'll go through those questions and, and connect you with the appropriate services and help you solve that situation. So you're going to get someone who knows what to do and can help you. 
do you have that available in the Spanish? We do use translation sometimes um, to help support folks who are um, not only Spanish speaking, but many different languages that reach out to us. Any other questions? I have kind of a delicate question um, for you. Is it something that, um, it, how do you, how do you, uh, like keep in touch with someone who has tried before. How do you do? You just every once in a while say, "Hey, thought of killing yourself lately." I mean, I'm just asking. Is, uh, what's the a, best thing? It's an okay question. It's, it absolutely is an okay question. People check in with you, and they they're going to do it in the way that they do it. Um, I mean, my I can tell you, my wife's not usually that blunt um, with me um, because she's I'm checking. She's not yeah. Um, she's because she's checking on me daily um, and just getting a, a sense of where I'm at. Um, I know that uh, there's, uh, I mean, my friend and uh, somewhat boss, I'm not sure what her role is sometimes in my life, Shelly Spaulding back there, um, will be just that frank. Um, she, I mean, uh, she's, you know, been so frank as to, um, do I need to keep your firearms? You know, or how are you doing right now? Do do I need do I need to keep your firearms? Um, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it, it, it it's hard to answer that question without um, like without knowing how you converse with your friends yeah. and what you know about your friends. Um, but she she knows me, and so she knows how to be specific enough with me to kind of get that point across. You gotta like, be somebody's friend before you ask them something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My 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 friend Michael, who was uh, started out as just a professional acquaintance, really, um, and we struck up a friendship. Um, he point blank just asked me on a phone call, "Are you thinking about killing yourself?" And I don't even remember what I said. I have no, I I don't remember what I said that triggered in him that he needed to ask me. That. And this was when you were thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, and he just went right there uh, that quickly. Um, you know, and that's that's where I go with with friends. I don't I don't waste my time with um, beating around the bush with people. If the hair on the back of my neck raises up with somebody, I immediately go to, "Are you thinking about killing killing yourself?" And, and like, like Nick said, if they say no, thank God, mm -hmm. thank God. I, I mean, I, I don't like being wrong. You can ask my wife how much I hate being wrong, but this is one of those this is one of those things where. I am completely satisfied with getting that wrong. What I don't want to do is learn later on that I was wrong for not asking. Because you didn't have the guts to ask. Yeah. yeah. The toughest, probably one of the toughest questions you can ever ask somebody. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's why um, uh, QPR is so, so uh, powerful because it it, it takes you through step by step in terms of um, somewhat like we did tonight, but it just really gets to the point of how to ask the question, when to ask the question, and, and, and kind of like your questions, Martine, what do I do next? And, and, and let's get into that. It's usually an hour to 90 minutes, and um, you know, we do it once a month uh, via Zoom, but we can also come into workplace, uh, any, really any venue, um, faith-based, whatever, uh, to, to deliver that training. Um, and it's the best when it's 90 minutes because then we can do a little role play. Um, uh, you, specifically you, have probably saved how many lives through this? Oh, I, I don't know. I couldn't put a number to it. But I, I, honestly, I, I can tell you, I can tell you through uh, our crisis walk-in center, um, Paul, make sure I don't get the numbers wrong, but I want to say we're just under um, 1,500 people that have been served through our walk-in crisis center since it opened. Positive outcome. But, um, yes, yes. That uh, alone has to make you never think about it. I mean, think about the resource you are. You know exactly how it feels. Yes, and I, you know, I, 
it's funny you're saying that because I don't usually look at things that way. When I look at when I look at what we do, I look at it as a team. You know, um, I that's that's just that's yeah. that's not the optic that I probably should look at it. But I'm just saying, you have to you have to recognize that somebody that is young and is going through those feelings is going to want to talk to somebody that has had those feelings before. I Lived mean, experience is powerful. I mean, it, it really is. And thank God you did it. I mean, thank God you got into this and you're helping other people. I mean, that's a perfect solution. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> what, thank she, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much for saying that. You're thank too kind. You. This is awesome. Can you speak on if people have a, the, the financial barrier that they think might exist to seeking help? Um, sure. Anyone can come to the Crisis Walk-In Center. And so that's, there's not a financial burden to coming to our Crisis Center um, or calling our support line or taking any of these classes. And ongoing um, treatments? Um, and so ongoing treatment, we'll, we'll work with people to figure out what's the best option. Um, and, you know, just like other medical professionals, what is their insurance, what's the best provider? And we'll go through all of that with individuals to work with them, um, whether that's a sliding fee scale, helping them get set up on Medicaid if that's a service that people need. So we'll, we'll work with people on what is it um, that they need in order to connect for services given their individual situation. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I would add, if you're not sure what to say, Brene Brown has a nice little short if you've seen it on empathy. Um, and she says in there in one point, um, I, I'm really glad you told me. I don't know what to say right now, but I'm just really glad you told me. So you can kind of memorize that to, to Nick's point of like, when you're trying to figure out, you know, and you need, you're taking that deep breath, you can kind of, um, you can repeat those words. I'm really glad you told me. I don't know exactly what to do, but I'll connect you with someone who does. We'll get you help. I'm just grateful that you told me what was going on. And so when you're doing that check-in, a few weeks later, you can use those words again. Hey, I just wanted to check back in. I'm really glad you shared with, that with me. How are you doing? Did you, you know, get connected with services? Are you doing okay? You know, thanks for sharing and trusting me with that. Does that help? Gives you a little bit of a, a, a time to kind of figure out what to say next. So I want to be, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, from my experience is people who are maybe ready to commit suicide or are in this hard time in their life, um, they may be intoxicated, they may be on drugs, and they don't want to speak to medical professionals or the police or they don't want to go to the hospital um, and they get scared of being in, in trouble and that they're going to go be locked away or be put in a mental institution or whatever. So my question is what's the best way to approach that for someone who is kind of in that state of mind that they don't want to be in trouble, they don't want this to affect their life on that level? You know, I, I think that, again, going back to Laura's point about how we respond when, when there's a medical emergency. So, I, I think we think about it in the same way that we think about taking somebody to an emergency department when they need to be there. Right? We might need to call for an ambulance. We, we might need to intervene in that way because we're trying to save your life. So, if we're speaking to somebody who's that way, we might be like, hey, let's, let's figure out how to keep you alive. All right. In, in the same way that if you were in a car accident or a motorcycle accident and you were lying there in a pool of blood, I would act immediately to save your life. And I'm going to do that right now. It's going to look and feel a little bit different because we're not seeing any pool of blood. We're not seeing any broken bones, but it's just as serious. So we don't mess around with it and, and, and it is about saving a life. And I think when that happens, going back to what you were talking about before, it, it kind of jars somebody. Yeah, this, this is about saving my life. And we want them in that place because then maybe they'll join with us to follow through with what needs to be done, even if they're intoxicated. So I hope that helps. 
And our walk-in center is open 24 hours a day. So you can bring your friend in that scenario to the walk-in center. And then beyond the walk-in center, we have a withdrawal management unit. So if that's an appropriate place, we can support them through that. Or a crisis stabilization unit, which is overnight. Those are overnight facilities. And so we can help match people's needs to the services. So again, it's just that amount of connecting people with the professionals who can take it further. It's a lot to carry. So helping people know that like, we can take care of this, let's connect with people who know what to do, um, and we'll go from there. Yeah, and you know, I've had not a lot of these experiences, but from friend to friend contact, they say, you call the police on me, or, you know, and they react in that hateful way. And I'm just trying to touch on that. Sure. Sure, don't hesitate to call our law enforcement. I mean, Commander Cox is here tonight in support of suicide prevention. Like, they're incredible professionals um, and will respond with kindness and do their job in support of our community members um, all the time. So please don't hesitate um, to do that. Sometimes people will say things that, like, you know, please don't call 911 or don't tell anyone. And, and just know that, like, getting help and connecting people to help is much more important than if they're mad at you later. Like, it's okay. Um, most of the time people are, you know, they, they understand and they actually feel like you cared for them afterwards. No guarantees, they might be mad, but most of the time people feel cared for um, afterwards and, and know that you did the best with, in that situation that you could. So don't hesitate to, con to call 911 or call support line or call anyone. Um, as I, I always tell my kid, there's, there's secrets we can keep and there are secrets we can't keep. Um, and so sometimes if folks tell you something, that, that we need to make sure they're safe. And then if we lose a friendship over that, it's okay. Sounds like you did the right thing by going after that help. Um, I, the thing we train in QPR is be doggedly relentless with that person. Um, if they all of a sudden are, are flipping around and saying, yeah, I'm really not suicidal, um, I, I'm not immediately going to buy that. You just told me you want to kill yourself. I'm going to be relentless about what you said. If they're under the influence, I'm going to stick to them like glue uh, through that. Uh, like Laura said, if I need to take them uh, to uh, a detox withdrawal management, I can do that to assist in that. But if it's, you know, um, if, they, if they need to sober from alcohol or they've been, been smoking or what have you, um, nothing prevents me from being that non-anxious presence with them as they sober up and continue that conversation through this. Uh, because at the end of the day, I'm trying to save your life. Unfortunately, like we said earlier, suicide's one of the most preventable uh, forms of death. Not all suicides will be prevented, unfortunately. And we, we can get to a point in a conversation with somebody that they're saying all the right things. We believe that we've got a good safety plan with them whether that's something we've done professionally or, or we've done uh, as a friend through our QPR training, um, and still the person may go on to complete suicide. Uh, that's, that's the, to me, that's the piece in this that while all the work that, that we do professionally and the opportunities to talk with somebody on a one-on-one -on -one basis can be extremely rewarding and, 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 and knowing that you're saving a life, there are times where um, you're just devastated because we, you know, take it personal that we didn't do enough or that institution didn't do enough or that family member didn't do enough or what have you. And at the end of the day, it's that one person that's responsible for that act. Not the institution, not the family member, not the friends, not their teacher, the absence of a teacher. It's that one person. And that's a hard thing to swallow when we think about a loved one that we've lost to suicide. Um, but ultimately, they're the accountable ones in this. Well, I want to be respectful of the time we're already um, well past our 7 o'clock advertised any time. So, we will be here for a few more minutes. I think we have the room until about 7:30. I did want to thank my colleague Amber Henning, who who really helped put this to really put this together. So, 
I want to say thank you to Amber for, for that. I want to say thank you to our panel, obviously. I mean, the experts in the room. Um, you know, I'm not an I don't have the credentials after my name that they do, but I've had to ask this question to my family. I've had to ask this question to my friends. Um, we can't control, as Ed said, whether or not someone is going to choose to take their life. We can only control whether or not we're going to, to take that step to ask the question and be there for them. So um, I hope you've learned some things tonight. If you have, share them with your friends, your family. Um, take one of our classes. Uh, if you need help, our Crisis Walk-In Center is there 24-7, 365 days, right down here on Cascade, North Cascade. Um, thank you for coming tonight. It means so much to me that so many in the community care so much about our community um, and those who live in this community. So thank you. And um, we will be here for a few more minutes. So please, um, there's lots of cookies and snacks. Take them with you, please, because otherwise, and there's lots of resources on the back table. So again, thank you.